we want to cover a movie this morning that is a true story. Okay, well, it's based on a true story. All right, well, it's based on really millions of true stories. It could be, it could be your story. Uh, it could be somebody, somebody you know. Maybe you can relate to the idea in this film. Um, we're going to look at a character who is bored with his life, bored with his job. Um, feels like he's just kind of stuck somewhere, and uh, that could be you. Maybe you're at a point in your life where you say, you know what, I'm, I'm bored with work. I don't like my, my job. Maybe we might say, some of us might say, you know what, my marriage isn't everything that I had hoped that it would be, and uh, so maybe you're struggling there, and maybe you, uh, your friendships aren't what they could be. Maybe you feel like your, your friendships are, are shallow, or, or just that life is, life is just empty. It, it's not holding much. For you. So instead of being grateful for what we do have, it's easy to begin to obsess about things that we don't have and focus on what we're missing in life and what we what we wish that we had. Maybe for you that's a house, you know. I'm sure nobody can relate to this idea. You know, if I only had a different house, nobody says small, well, some people say small, right, today. If only I had a smaller house, everything would be better. Um, if only I had a bigger house, everything would be better. Uh, if I had, you know, if I could get this certain salary, then life would be easy, right? You can see the weakness in that already. Uh, maybe it's the right relationship. If I found that right somebody, and if you don't find that right somebody, ditch the one you got and keep looking for somebody else, right? Maybe I'll find somebody else. Or if I had influence and, and power, maybe more respect. That's really what would, would really do something for me in my life. But it's amazing the more we accomplish those kinds of goals and, and the more we fulfill those kinds of dreams and wishes, um, the sooner we begin to realize that those things that we obsessed over and those things that we thought were going to make us happy really leave us empty. And we realize that those really weren't the answers to what we really needed after all. And when we begin to feel as though this, this bottomless pit of desire and if only, if only, if only the next thing seems to never be filled. Well, we're gonna look at a character this morning. Uh, anybody recognize the film already? Uh, I know there's a, a few of you. We're gonna look at a main character. I didn't look up how to pronounce this or how to say it, but Ignacio, I believe is, is how you pronounce his name. And he was constantly on a quest for something better, something different, and something more, like, like many of us. And like so many people, uh, he occasionally liked to wear stretchy pants. Sometimes you wear stretchy pants <laughs> in your room, just for fun. Don't worry, I won't tell nobody. <laughs> Number one, not everybody looks great in stretchy pants. All right, so if you didn't learn anything else today, you got, you got that. Take that with you and, and uh, run with that. So Ignacio is a cook at the orphanage. Seems like uh, a pretty good gig. If he's not happy with his life, if he's not happy with his job, at least it can be said, you know, you're doing something meaningful. You're taking care of, of children. You're taking care of, of orphans. But Ignacio, like so many, is bored with his job. And uh, now I, we have to give him credit. He genuinely loves the children. So he's got a great heart. He loves the orphans. But his job just feels empty and unfulfilling. It reminds me of what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 2.11 when he says, Yet when I surveyed all...
chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Solomon had a pretty full life. There were those that were, that were worse off than Solomon. And even Solomon looked around, and it was maybe it was even a result of the position that he had and his great wisdom and uh, the accumulation of wealth. It might have been even because of that he realized that all of this doesn't satisfy and life still doesn't mean all that much. So Ignacio dreamed of something better. He dreamed of a, a better life, a, a different life, and he, he decided that the answer for him would be to become a professional wrestler. Isn't that everyone's first go-to? You know, the only <laughs> uh, professional wrestler. Or maybe it's the right relationship or a date with Sister Encarnacion over toast. So, do you enjoy yourself here at the Brotherhood? The children, I love the children. They are my heart. The children, the children. The brothers make me cook, stew, and stuff all day, but they don't give me money for fresh ingredients. And they don't think I know a butler. <laughs> Today, I saw a man in town. People were throwing daisies at him and giving him goodies. Sometimes I would like that kind of respect. Who was this man? Well, to tell you the truth, he was a luchador. <laughs> Very spiritual, so that doesn't mean that shall pass. So I've never heard that expression, never used that expression, but I thought it was interesting that uh, those around him accused him of not knowing a lot about the gospel, but he actually did. So he's a friar who works at the orphanage, but he's a man of the cloth. I still don't know what that means. I still don't know what that term means, but uh, but that's what he is, a man of the cloth. Um, but he actually did know a lot about. Um, speaking of the gospel, Matthew 16, 24 says this, and uh, 24 and 25 says this. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, this is so important, but whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me, will find it. Interesting, interesting things um, in those few short verses. He says, if you want to come after him, you must deny yourself, take up your cross or your burden, and follow him. And if you want to save your life, it's wise to lose it. It's best to lose it. But whoever loses his life, I'm sorry, if you, want, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. And whoever loses their life for his sake and for the gospel will actually find it. Our culture says, and really, it's, we could blame our culture, but it's, it's something within each of us. I, I'm sure there were a great many cultures that said, ours might be worse, I don't know. But our culture says to gratify yourself. Look out for yourself first. Maybe look out for yourself only. Take care of number one. Number one is your spouse or your children. Right? Number one is you. Take care of yourself first. Promote yourself. Do anything you can to get ahead. Make others, maybe at work, make others look bad so that that can make you look good. So Jesus said that if we really want to live, that we need to deny ourselves. Well, what, is that? what does it mean to deny yourself? Then take up your cross, take up a uh, burden. What does that mean? It means to lay down our own desires, to not put ourselves. First, not, it's not, we're not teaching to not take care of yourself or 
to, uh, you know, to have, have no care for your own life. We're not teaching that. In fact, the Bible doesn't teach that either. But, but looking out for number one, looking out for only you, it means that your primary desires, everything you want and getting everything you want should not be your primary concern. Laying down your life means surrendering your will to what the your own preferences. And we do that so that the Lord can live through us and love through us. We put the bigger picture first. We lay down um, putting ourselves first. And when we put the Lord first, it's funny how that works, that he has a way of encouraging us and causing us to put others first as well. I don't know about you, but I will admit, even the preacher doesn't like denying or denying my own desires or dying to myself. It's not my favorite thing. It's dark, so if you want to agree with me and raise a hand or whatever, I won't even know. You know, I can't, oh, I can see, I can't. There's a few of you, all right. Um, if we're honest, we really don't like that idea of dying to ourself and, and surrendering our will to the Lord's. But what do we do when what we have doesn't satisfy us? And when we've pursued our own interests only and we've pursued our own lusts and we've pursued only our own passions, and then we look around and we find out that we're really still left empty. Ignazio finds himself in a situation and he realizes that, you know what, maybe this isn't such a great uh, job that I have. I'm better than this. I'm going to get myself a better duty. It's quiet for that. I'm surprised. Yeah, right. There it is. What is this? Petals. Enjoy. There is no flavor. There are no spices. Where are the cheese? Somebody stole them. Did you not tell them that they were the Lord's cheese? I was trying to. You are useless, Ignacio. Try the Robert. All right, I'm glad you laughed at that part. I thought that was funny, too. The bikers in the place <laughs> will notice. He's like, ugh. And then he starts to kind of slowly, just slowly pull away. All right, so Ignacio, uh, in his quest for a better duty, um, he says he's the gatekeeper of his life. He's, he wants to be in charge. He wants to be in control of his own destiny. And like Ignacio, many of us want to seek our own glory day in the, in the hot sun. I know something about the hot sun. I'm not sure I know much about our glory day. But as we try to find, and as we'll see Ignacio, as we try to find ourselves and find those kinds of things that satisfy us, we'll realize, as Ignacio eventually does, that we actually... Super cool name. Um, if there's anybody out there that's, you know, with child, just consider Bill Fredo. Uh, Bill Fredo, Fredo, you know, Alfredo. Smith. Alfredo. Yeah, well, yeah, you can change your last name. Uh, so, so he was an Italian economist in the early part of the 19th century. And he came up with this 80 20 principle. Some of you, no doubt, have heard of the, the 80 20 principle. So, um, it's the idea, and he, well, he noticed in, in his uh, work that about 20% of the people uh, had about 80% of the wealth. And after noticing that, he realized that he began to look around, he began to see this principle repeating itself over and over. And he, he noticed that 20% of the pea pods in his garden produced 80% of the peas. And on and on and on, we can see this represented. You may have heard it in the workplace that 20% of the people produce 80% of the production or the productivity. Um, and, and that they say that, that, I think I first heard of this in Bible school. They said that's true in church. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And uh, it also works in reverse, that 20% of the people cause the biggest prob cause 80% of the problems at work. <laughs> Or a church, you know. You, originally, you were striving. I want to be one of the twenty 
percent, which 20 is very important. <laughs> Don't let that be lost on you this morning, right? So, um, but there's other ways that we can look at this too, and it's not an exact science. I mean, some have criticized and said, well, it's not exactly true. Well, of course it's not exactly true. Uh, but there are some astounding examples of, uh, of this uh, 2080 or 8020 crystal um, being somewhat or near uh, close to life and pretty, pretty reliable. Um, but this principle is helpful in other ways too. Because Ignacio, well, in life, we seldom get 100%. Life is not a 100% type deal. For example, we might finally get our dream vacation, but it rains for two days, right? We might get our dream house. It's a wonderful, great place, but the plumbing's bad and you need to replace the roof. Or maybe you finally get that dream job. If I could just get this job, boy, I'll, I'll be set. But your boss is hard to work for and the hours are long. This kind of thing happens in, in life. You know, maybe you have a spouse that meets 80% of your expectations, which is actually, when we're talking spouses, that's pretty high. It's not, it's not important to give a number this morning. And I, I, I felt compelled, yeah. I felt the Spirit of God speak to me this morning and tell the husbands, don't go home and say, you know, honey, you're really more like 82%. <laughs> That would be, we'll be doing a marriage series after this one. If that's, if that's okay. You don't have to put a number on it. But subconsciously in our minds, we're always looking for the 100%. And, and a human being, a fallen human being, who meets 80% of our expectations is really pretty good. But in a quest and a desire for that missing 20%, we begin to look outside of our marriage, at maybe another man or another woman. Maybe our job is 80% satisfying, but you know it doesn't have everything. And so we quit what we have, the stability and the place, and maybe we move and we take our families look uh, across the country uh, looking for that elusive and deceptive 20%. I encourage you this morning, be aware of the Pareto principle, which again is not a scientific, uh, necessarily scientifically accurate to the moment, but to the to the to the exact degree. But the principle seems to replicate itself over and over in life, and we see that our ourselves, much like Ignacio, or we may have the eighty percent. We we look at what we don't have, rather than being grateful for this. We look at what we don't have, and we pursue this, and in the process. We lose the 80% that we already have. What's wrong with you? Well, sister, they are just niños trying to release their wiggles. Ignacio. They're wrestling in a sacred place. Okay, Orbans, listen to me. Listen to Ignacio. I know it's fun to wrestle. And I spine drive to the face. Or punch to the face. But you cannot do it. Because it is in the Bible not to wrestle your name. So you never wrestle? Me? No, come on, don't be crazy. Listen, I know the rest will get all the fancy ladies, the clothes, the pretty creams and lotions. But my life is good. Really good. I get to wake up every morning, 5 a.m., eat some soup. It's the best. I love it. I get to lay in a bed by myself all of my life. <laughs> Go. Go away. Read some books.
All right, so Ignacio does what many of us do or have done or attempted to do. Consumed with dissatisfaction about his life, he pursues the missing 20%. Trying to find his life, he passionately pursues fame, glory, and it should not be lost on any of us, free creams and lotions. (laughs) I guess. That seems like a weird goal for a professional wrestler to to have. Um, So he finally becomes a professional wrestler. Uh, We won't, uh, you won't see the whole process, the the whole processor, but that's kind of funny. He finally becomes a professional wrestler and only to find that the elusive 20% wasn't even close to what he was looking for. I'm a friar. I'm not from that world. The orphans, they need me. And I have forsaken them. I got no grocery for breakfast because of you. I'm sick of hearing about your stupid orphans. What did you just say? I hate orphans. Uh-huh. Say it again, this. I hate them. Come again? I hate all the orphans in the whole world. I'm not listening to you. You only believe in science. That's probably why we never win. We never win because you are fat. <laughs> Oh, man. There's so many other things I want to say that aren't in my notes. You have any responsibility to these children? Uh, can we stop that one? All right, we'll start, we'll start this one. Oh, yeah, actually, you can leave, you can leave it right there. Um, so he's in a fight with, he gets in a fight with, his, uh, with his partner, and uh, partially because this new life as a wrestler isn't really working out so so great as we might have anticipated. So now he gets a new name, uh, Nacho Libre, and uh, at this at this point in the in the movie, he's still not winning in life. He's pursuing his dream, but he's lost some things too, and he's unsat. He's still unsatisfied. Why is he unsatisfied? Because he's fighting for the wrong things. He's still empty. He still feels hollow. He's still unfulfilled. That's like many of us. We pursue this thing and pursue that thing. But life is still empty. Life is still hollow. And life is still unfulfilling. That's what we do sometimes. We pursue more stuff, more money, maybe more leisure, more recognition, more influence. And that's why Sister, okay, I got I practice this. Incarnation's, ah, Sister Incarnation's message, we'll, we'll get an English movie next time. Uh, Sister Incarnation's message is so important to Ignacio and also for us. She instructs Ignacio that when you fight, you don't just fight for yourself, you fight for something that matters. You fight for someone who needs your help. You fight for something that lasts. Oh, where have you been? I've been gone because I had a lot of churchy opportunities, Vicky. Outside of the orphanage. Like what? Where were you last night? To tell you the truth, I went to a wrestling match, Lucha Libre. Went to watch a wrestling match? Kind of. You're a man of the clothes. Lucha Libre, it's a sin. But why? Because those men fight for vanity, for money, for false pride. Yes, it's terrible. 
No. If you fight for something noble, or for someone who needs your help, only then will God bless you in battle. You must pray for forgiveness. Excuse me. The movie thing is actually faster than my normal sermon, so we have all the time. And I will win. Because our Heavenly Father will be in the ring with me. And right, he and I will right. 10,000 pesos. And we did. Talk amongst yourselves. It's not like you won't. If anyone knows why this is doing this, I would, we would love to... Uh, like Visit the concession stand for a or drink or a pop. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. <laughs> Remember that at the driving theaters? Yeah, you get the pull up. Precious Father, why have you given me this desire to wrestle and then made me such a stinky warrior? Have I focused too much on my boots and on my fame and my stretchy pants? <laughs> Wait a second. Maybe you want me to fight and give everything I win to the little ones who have nothing so they can have better foods and a better life. Yeah, maybe that. Okay, if I win tonight at the battle jam, I will know that you bless my mission and that you want me to be a wrestling servant of you. Let's make cookies. fight the seven strongest men in town. Maybe the world. And I will win. Because our Heavenly Father will be in the ring with me. And he and I will win 10,000 pesos. And with it, I will buy the orphans a big wealth to go on field trips to parks and places like that. I'm serious. I needed a minute. Come on, anybody? His lip quivers. Want to fight an orphan's a bus? And uh, get a little, a little teary-eyed. I said, good job. Good job, Jack. 
And then as he walks away, like, he looks cool, like, walking away from the church, you know. Like, I'm going to get in the wrestling ring because our Heavenly Father will be in the ring with him. So, um, so he wants to do something. So he realizes that, you know, there's there a greater purpose than just me seeking glory for myself and getting uh, respect and accolades and, yeah, things and emotions and that stuff, too. Uh, he realizes that, you know what, if I'm going to fight, I can fight for somebody that's, that doesn't have much. I can fight for somebody else. I can fight to make a difference in someone else's life. I'm reminded of Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to the king. Not, he was a servant, but it's a pretty cushy job. It's not, it's not terrible. And uh, he gives up that position to go and repair Jerusalem and its walls. He, he is grieving over the fact that his home and the city of God is in ruins, and the, the walls of protection around the city lay in ruins. He's concerned about his people and his home. Nehemiah gives up his position, and, and he goes back to Jerusalem and begins work on rebuilding the walls. And he faces severe opposition, opposition of, of all sorts. And uh, at, some, at one point, um, there's even threats, that, threats of violence, and that they would be killed if they would continue this work on rebuilding the walls, these protective walls around the city. Nehemiah takes some measures to, to overcome that opposition. And then in Nehemiah 4.14, he says this, After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them, he said. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. I love that. And fight for your brothers, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, and for your homes. Nehemiah says, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord is on our side. He's great and he's awesome. And remember, remember people to fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah is reminding them that there is something worth fighting for. Maybe there are some of us here today that need to deny ourselves to follow Jesus and to fight for what matters most. Well, Ignacio decides to fight for the children, not for his own glory, so that he could buy the children a bus so that he could take them to parks and places like that. I want to ask you the question this morning. Who will you fight for? Is there somebody that you could fight for? Somebody that you could stand up for? Is there a difference for someone else that you could make? Maybe you could fight for somebody who doesn't know Christ. By fight, that could be putting in time, sharing the gospel with them. learning the scriptures to present the gospel to somebody, uh, or just praying. Instead of, uh, instead of pursuing something that's selfish for you, maybe pray that this individual might come to know Christ. Maybe you fight for someone in poverty, or you could fight to give someone else a better life. By the way, thanks to all the volunteers for STEM for them who put in an entire week here, Monday through Friday. Well, they had a day off due to the thunderstorms that happened. They only, they only worked half a day. What, what it worked? Well, I didn't know it was that kind of deal. How much did they get paid? No, they worked. Still work. They're all volunteers. So I appreciate uh, the Semper Them volunteers so much. Why were they doing that? They did that to give someone that's disadvantaged a better life. They're fighting for someone else. Who will you fight for? How about your marriage? Your marriage is worth fighting for. Your marriage is worth putting in a little bit of time. Your marriage is worth whatever it takes to make that work. I haven't, you know, I've been at this a few years and I'm astounded at how many people come to myself or 
or someone, a counselor, or, or they seek help after so much damage has been done. And even in my few years here, I, I can think of numerous examples of, of people that come to you and go, wow, uh, if only you'd sought help before this happened or before that happened or, or earlier, before the bitterness and the unforgiveness was so intense and so great. If only you would have fought for that marriage sooner. Maybe it means fighting for someone else's marriage, a loved one. Maybe it means helping them out, coming alongside of them, giving them some kind of assistance or help or encouraging them to get some assistance or some help. I found that in my ministry that there are so many times when people come to a place in their lives where they say, you know what, I just don't care anymore. And you know what I've discovered? A day comes where they care. That statement, I just don't care anymore, is very, very often proven wrong. Who's worth fighting for? Maybe it's worth fighting for those in human trafficking or somebody in the city where you live or, or a friend who's suffering from depression. And maybe they're thinking about taking their own life. Is that person worth the time? Are they worth fighting for? Jesus taught us, and Sister Encarnacion taught us that we should fight. And there is a good reason to fight for people that we can help. Maybe rather than sitting on the sidelines, we can engage in the battle. We can join the fight against the forces of darkness, and we can make a difference in the world around us. I want to remind you again of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. He said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. Dear sister, I know you probably hate my cuss by now and already believe that I must have died long ago in the wilderness. But you are wrong. I'm still alive. Tonight I'll be fighting the greatest wrestler who ever lived, the great Ramses. I know you don't like wrestling, but know that I am leaving all my money to the orphans. And if I die in the ring, know that I always loved you as a brother in God. Ignacio. P.S. If we didn't end up taking our vows of celibacy, we could maybe get married and have a family with some niños. But you know, whatever. <laughs> hug, hug. Kiss, kiss. Hug, hug. Big kiss. Little hug, keys, keys, little keys.
by your spirit, you'd speak to us and say, you know what, I've been living for me. I haven't really laid down my desires. Lord, I pray, you know, we're all working on this, preachers, preachers included. If the Lord's convicting you this morning and say, you know what, there's an area that I, I want you to lay down. There's an area that you need to surrender. There's ways in which you can give yourself to others. That you can fight for something meaningful, something lasting, something permanent. And I just pray that right now as the Spirit of God speaks to you, that you just lay that thing down or take that, take that thing up And fight for something bigger and greater than yourself. Maybe this morning, and I don't I don't know how 
this is working with online. I don't know what you can see or if this makes any sense or if uh, some copyright person has shut this down already. Uh, by the way, I would watch this fast if you want to watch this because uh, we're going to try to put this up. We've never tried this. We don't know if it will be taken down immediately. We're not sure how that is going to work out. But maybe you're watching online and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never put your faith in him. Well, that's, I mean, that's the most important way to, li to lay down your life that we can talk about here this morning. I encourage you, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to surrender to him today. Lay down your life, take up the cross, and follow him. I remember hearing that as a child. You want to be a Christian, you have to lay down your life. And I had, well, early in life, I had zero interest in being a minister of the gospel. That is for sure. That was scary as a little kid, five years old. It sounds a little scary. What do you mean, surrender my life? That's that's the biggest thing I have. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have, will you take a check? Can I give you money? Is there something that, like, the, the, the most valuable thing I have is my life. You know, the enemy wants to come along, and your own mind comes along and says, you know, you do this, you will be absolutely miserable. That's the message of Nacho Libre this morning, and that's my message to you, that when we lay down our lives, we live for something bigger and greater than ourselves. That's not the end of a fulfilling life. That's how you attain a fulfilling life. Everybody's not called to be a minister, but I absolutely love what I do. I, I would do it. I, I, somebody has to buy me food, but I would do it. <laughs> We see those people on TV, they win the lottery or something. Oh, I'm going to keep working. How long does that last? You know, a week, something, you know, I don't know how long. I don't know who, I don't know who holds the record or who came into some money and continued at their job. I, I, I'll do this forever. It's satisfying. It's fulfilling. It's meaningful. If you've contemplated receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior and you think, man, that sounds, I mean, that's the message of the whole day today. If we lay down our lives, we actually find it. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you today, go to him. Turn from selfish ambition, selfish. Turn from living only for you. Ask him to forgive you of your sin. He will do it. Lord, we thank you that through your great love, the forgiveness and the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ, that there's not one Within the sound of my voice, that's too far gone, too far lost. Too far gone. Well, your arms can't reach them. You can't save them. And then mend them and heal them. Lord, we thank you that you're an awesome, loving, forgiving, gracious Heavenly Father. We thank you for those today that maybe they accepted Christ for the very first time. I encourage you. Sometimes I pray with you to lead you in a prayer. It's not absolutely necessary. It's a tool that we use. You can call out to God on your own. You don't need my prayer. You call it. So let us know if that's you. Contact us. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, there's just this area that I need to surrender to or 
this thing that God's been calling me to do, and I haven't, I just kind of been putting it off. Lord, I thank you for lives that have been changed today. Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory for that. In Jesus' awesome and mighty name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right. So, you see, at the movies is a little different this time, right? Doing it a little differently. So, somebody said, I'm not a hard salesman. But somebody said to me last week, you know, I'm thinking about checking out your church. And I said, you've got to do it this week. I mean, don't wait. <laughs> like, this is, the, this, is right, this is the time to do it. Like, we, who knows? We might start a series on fasting afterwards. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, people, Christian, I mean, I wouldn't tell you about doing that, and you know why. <laughs> the 